about how to get beyond cold calls. And we're going to take a look at some no cost, to low cost, and strategic marketing ideas. Now, before we get started, um, I have to give everyone a little forewarning. Uh, in the process of putting together today's webinar, I tried to think through lots of different ways to effectively help you with business development, selling, as well as recruiting. And the forewarning that I want to share with everybody is some of these ideas are pretty strategic, almost uh, requiring a rethinking of your business model. And some of the ideas are pretty tactical. Um, some really, really specific things that we'll get to at the end to improve response to the kinds of activities you do every single day. Now, my, my forewarning is that no matter what I do, somebody's going to be unhappy because it's not going to be all strategic and it's not going to be all tactical. So I've tried to provide a good mix, but if I don't get to something that you have a question about or you want to drill deeper into something that we're covering, please submit questions or use our Lunch with Haley hashtag and feel free to ask questions and we'll do our best to answer. That stated, let's kick things off. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, our agenda for today's webinar is first talking about how to avoid a commodity trap. Now, I have somebody saying the screen is blank. Hopefully, it will pop up. I see um, it. I'm looking at the audience view. Let's try stopping and restarting. Pardon me for one second. We will restart. And there we go. Okay, so hopefully you can now see everything. All right, so the first topic is avoiding commodity traps. And we're going to talk about how to prevent your firm from getting positioned in the unenviable position of being just like every other staffing and recruiting firm. We're going to talk about ways that you can sell smarter. And by that, I mean finding ways to sell solutions to problems that will generate higher margins. And more importantly, it's going to generate people wanting to come to talk to you rather than you having to call and call and call to chase them down to get an appointment. We're going to talk about how to get more results from the things you're already doing every single day, from sending email to picking up the telephone to using social media, we'll talk about some very tactical strategies to get more people to respond, more candidates to apply, so that uh, without spending a dime, you can get more impact from your sales, marketing, and recruiting efforts. We're going to spend a little bit of time on some specific free and low-cost marketing ideas. And then if I haven't completely used up this hour, we'll have some time for Q&A. But don't worry, if we need to stay over for Q&A, I will be happy to stay on the line. All right, so that said, let's jump in. So first and foremost, the goal of every staffing company is differentiation. You know, how do we stand out from the, the crowd? How do we not look like a commodity? And as I was uh, looking for images for today's presentation, I came across this cartoon, and it's a little blurry, um, so I'll read it. Uh, it's a, it's a Classic Dilbert one, slide number one, we can't compete on price. Then the manager is saying, we also can't compete on quality, features, or service. That leaves fraud, which I'd like you to call marketing. So I got a kick out of this. Hopefully, um, for everybody at the team from Haley Marketing Group, uh, we're not committing fraud. But uh, I think in a lot of businesses, um, people search for what's the tagline we should use or what's this next campaign we should come up with. And, and one of the first points I want to make about differentiation is if your service process isn't any different, if your model isn't any different, uh, marketing doesn't fix somebody who's stuck being a commodity. So it, you know, this is going to sound kind of trite, but if you want to be seen as being different, you actually have to be different. And as I said in the next slide, the world's most expensive marketing is selling the same thing the same way as everybody else. I remember reading some marketing pundit years ago who had a quote that's saying that advertising is the cost of not being different. In other words, you know, the more me too we are in how we sell and how we service, the more we have to spend on sales and marketing. So if we look at our income statement at the end of the month, that line that says sales and marketing expense is much higher when there's no differentiation, when there's nothing we're doing to really deliver a different value to the customer than all of our competitors. So how do we differentiate a staffing firm or a recruiting firm? Well, here's a couple of, of very rudimentary strategies that 
some companies are successfully implementing. First one is talent quality, and it sounds obvious. We want to deliver higher quality candidates than the employer can find on their own or than the competition down the street can deliver. So how do you deliver higher quality? Well, if you start looking at your business and say, okay, can we somehow have better reach into the talent pool that we're trying to serve. So if you've got the best access to talent for a specific skill set, you're going to be able to provide higher talent quality. Now let's assume that you don't have any better access than the company down the street. Then the next thing you can do is looking at the talent evaluation process. Are there ways that we filter candidates differently? I, mean, I love it when, when an employer says, you know, every staffing company is alike. You're all, you're all drawing candidates from the same talent pool. And my response to that is, yeah, but we don't all use the same fishing pole. Because, of course, we're all drawing from the same universal talent pool. But we don't all go to the same spots to fish. So one company may have a better place to find talent than another. And another company may have a better way to filter. So we may have to do a better job of really screening based on skills, behavioral traits, uh, or other measures of fit or likelihood of performance. Another way that to differentiate is a combination of the first three things on here, but talent quality a lot of times comes from your experience in a specific industry or with a specific type of client, and I'll talk more about that in just a minute. So talent quality is first and foremost, and every staffing company wants to differentiate on quality, but if you're going to say we're different on quality, you somehow have to prove how are you different, and that's about building a different service model. The next thing to differentiate on is service, and I usually tell people you can't differentiate on service because it's kind of a cost of doing business in the staffing industry. Um, but then you run into a company like a Zappos who took a commoditized internet business, shoe delivery, and this absolutely fanatical, passionate commitment to service and said we can find a way to differentiate on the service experience. Uh, I know we've got one company that does uh, ERP and IT staffing, and they've really developed a completely unique model for how they stand out in terms of the way they approach servicing their clients. And in, it's kind of not just the way every other IT firm recruits. Uh, it, I, I can't get into this, the secrets of how they do it on today's call, but they have a great model that is truly different to say each and every time we do something, it's going to be different. And that's kind of the key to differentiating on service. Service isn't really about having great people who are customer focused. It's about having a world-class process that everybody adheres to, even a process that can be adapted to each client. But you want to have a service model that stands out. The next type of differentiation is specialization. And this is probably the most common one in executive recruiting where you get microscopically focused on a segment of the industry where you can do a better job recruiting than anybody else because you know the candidates, you know the clients, you know the industry challenges, and every person you're going to provide is going to be a great fit. Um, specialization does work in temporary staffing as well. Usually the challenge with specialization is the more tightly you define the market, the greater the geography you have to serve because it gets too small to serve in one local market. So if I'm a commercial staffing firm in Rochester, New York, you know, and I only want to do uh, people that do a certain type of assembly, well, that might not work because the market in Rochester, New York may not be big enough, but I could focus on those type of assembly people in Rochester and Syracuse and Buffalo and New York City. Um, a company we're working with right now focuses on a very specific category of people in the power industry. They're doing light industrial and skilled labor jobs, but they're able to do it nationally because of their really tight specialization. The next thing to look at is speed. And when companies use a recruiting firm or a staffing firm, that's usually what they want. I need a person. I need a person now. So how do you redefine your service model so that you are able to provide talent faster than the competition. I know we work with a company down in the Carolinas and they were really proactive about recruiting for all the position they, positions they commonly filled for. They had an on-demand labor force that was available every single day for all those last minute requests so that they could be the fastest at speed for clerical and light industrial jobs. There's a couple of other ways to differentiate that aren't on here. You can also differentiate in terms of the client you focus on. Um, one of our clients says, we're only going to work with companies that are MSPs. Now, most of the staffing industry hates MSPs because it forces your prices and margins down to a level you don't like them. This company took the opposite approach saying, hey, 
we're going to build a completely different business, we're going to build a different service model, but we're going to be solely focused on servicing this one unique type of customer, because by being hyper-focused, they're able to stand out from nearly every other staffing company. If you go to an MSP's website, you'll see they may work with five or 10,000 staffing firms around the world. This company said we can be different than all five or 10,000 because of our focus on the MSP and because of the service model we built behind it. And lastly, a way to differentiate is to focus on your internal employees. Because ultimately, the quality of your service and the quality of the talent you provide is driven by the quality of your internal staff. So if you've uh, ever heard Dan Campbell from Higher Dynamics talk about what differentiates his firm down in Atlanta, you know, he talks about the importance of being a best place to work for internal staff and the ability to hire the best people and retain the best people is the key to being different because you know, in staffing a lot of times it is ultimately about the people. So those are six different models and again this is the real strategic end because this is about changing your business to get very focused on having a, a different process, a different focus, a different service model that enables you to truly stand out from the competition. Now another way to differentiate is to find ways to build a better mousetrap. In other words, don't provide staffing services the same way everybody else does. And two common ways to do that are to move up the value chain. So whether it's through offering on-site programs, being an MSP, offering RPO services, or maybe even taking ownership of project solutions, you take on a different level role. You're solving bigger problems. You're taking ownership of more than labor per hour. You're taking ownership of some outcome. This is what consulting firms do. They take ownership of the outcome. So if you hire an IT consulting firm, well, you may be paying a markup of 300 or 400 or 500 percent of the payroll of the worker doing the work because that firm owns the output. Whereas if you used a IT staffing firm, well maybe you're at 70 to 100 percent markup on payroll. The difference is how much responsibility you take in solving the problem. Um, that is why you see now the major global staffing companies don't say we're staffing companies, they say we're workforce solutions firms. They're trying to find all kinds of different ways to move up the value chain, own bigger problems because bigger problems come with bigger margin solutions. Now the opposite of that is to look for ways to disintermediate somebody in the middle and that's what online staffing companies are doing to the staffing and recruiting industry. They're trying to say, hey let's eliminate the middleman. We'll match the employer and the job seeker together through a, a software platform to really change how the industry works. We'll wipe out the middleman so that we can offer a better value to both the employee and the employer. Um, that's kind of what Uber has done to the taxi cab industry. It said we can build a different model to disintermediate the middleman. Now that is a, a strategy. Some of you may be looking at how do we get into online staffing and how do we change the business model. That is a great way to differentiate. Um, a, a related way to disintermediation is to look for ways to drive cost out of your service process. To sort of process map everything you do. This is kind of the lean manufacturing view of the world. Eliminate everything that's potentially waste. Uh, one of my favorite examples in recruiting is the whole idea of contingent placement. If you ever saw an area of staffing that is filled with waste, it's contingent placement because, hey, we're going to go recruit a bunch of people. If you see somebody you like, you hire them, then you pay me. So in other words, if you don't see somebody, you don't pay me. And if I have to go work on three or five assignments to get someone who pays me, essentially I need to charge enough so that everybody who didn't hire my candidate, uh, it covered my time that got wasted in those candidates. So there may be ways to think about different service models that drive cost out of re recruiting and staffing that enable you to offer a better value to the client while making as much or even higher margins to making today, but ultimately what you're selling is a lower cost way to get things done. And that is in another example of the better mousetrap. Another way to differentiate is looking at the overall service experience from the client side or the candidate side and how do we make that experience more exceptional. It was really inter interesting, Inavero, and I had a chance to see Eric Gregg from Inavero just last week give a presentation, Inavero did a study where they looked at the perception staffing firms have of the quality of their services versus the perception that employers and job seekers have. And as you might guess, there's a big disconnect. 
as an industry, we tend to think really, really highly of the quality of our services. Uh, about 75 to 80% positive view of our services, whereas when you ask employers and job seekers, it was still favorable, but it was significantly lower positive impression of our industry. So what does that mean? There's a disconnect. That means there's an opportunity to truly make the experience more exceptional, and you may do that through any of the things you see on the screen, through better communication, human communication or electronic communication, to keep people more informed all the time, to provide faster feedback, more honest feedback, more timely response to all of their questions related to finding a job or finding the talent they need to get work done. It may be by more of a commitment to outcomes, taking an ownership or having some sort of a gain sharing, whereas you're reducing turnover rates or you're improving time to fill or you're improving candidate quality, not only do you get paid for the hours your people are working, but you own a bonus for the outcome that you're delivering, the economic value you're delivering to the organization. There may be ways to expand the range or depth of your services, to offer more ways to solve clients' problems. So you may take ownership of a greater percentage of the hiring process, or maybe you get into the world of onboarding and you really start to provide onboarding services, or, or further uh, extended into talent management and doing regular reviews and feedback and assessment. The greater the depth of services that you can provide the client, the more of an exceptional experience you're able to deliver. Uh, and lastly, the really simple one is to look at every single touch point you have with your candidates, you have with your clients. Document them, every single touch point, and then say, for each one of those touch points, what can we do to make it a more exceptional experience for our clients and our candidates? What are other companies doing that make it better? If you look at a company like Zappos, that's what they do. They look at every single point of contact with a customer and say, how can we make it more painless, less friction, less work to do for the client. How can we be faster? How can we make it more enjoyable? Uh, one of my favorite companies is a print vendor we use, a company called Poster Brain. And they print big format posters. They do it at a great price. But they also have it's very standardized communications that they do via email and they do via little cards they put along with your packaging that just make the service experience more fun and it's those little tiny details that make them a better company than any other printer we've worked with. Next idea for differentiation is to learn to tell a better core story. Now a core story is not a message about why your company's better. A core story is literally a story. It's an educational tale. Think of it almost as a fable, where you are illustrating some point that matters to your clients, that teaches them something they would want to learn but didn't really know. And you teach it to them in such a way that it's helping to position the value of your services. So what the heck do I mean by all of this? So on the screen, you see an example of one, a core story we did years ago called Profit Drivers. And we were dealing with a company that sold mostly industrial staffing in a small market in southeastern Pennsylvania. And they were, like many light industrial staffing firms, stuck in the commodity basket. Their differentiation was they really did have a service process geared towards higher quality industrial workers. They rejected about 65% of candidates they saw. They had very strict policies on absenteeism and tardiness. Uh, they did a phenomenal job of managing their workforce. But they couldn't sell just that better service by saying, hey, we're a staffing company with better service because every client would just say, that sounds great, but so-and-so can do it for less. So what we needed to do was get a way to get the executives in these firms interested in this higher value. And that's where this profit driver story came in. So we, we created a story about how to run a more visionary, organization and it was told through a series of workbooks where we showed people how to be more of a visionary leader, how to develop an effective staffing system, how to manage people for the highest levels of performance, and how to use staffing more intelligently, how to do workforce planning to run your business more profitably. We, we sent this message to senior executives who normally couldn't care less about staffing, but we showed them how they needed to, needed to care about staffing because it was a driver of profit in their organization. Well, the result was we got more meetings with senior executives than this sales team had ever had, and it was just by having a great story to tell. We didn't even talk about what the company did until we were four 
direct mail pieces into this campaign and then we finally introduced the client to what this company could do to help drive profit through an efficient use of industrial staff. Uh, the next one, a case of corporate anorexia. This is an, another company we work with that dealt with a lot of people, a lot of manufacturers that were really into lean manufacturing and they were thinking they could save money by taking staffing in-house. And so we really wanted to show them how the whole concept of lean manufacturing, while being very good for reducing cost, there's a point of diminishing returns. And we showed people that America's obsession with lean was having negative consequences on productivity, morale, turnover, quality, and a whole bunch of other issues. We presented the case, again, to higher level HR people, to department managers, to people that understood lean manufacturing. And we showed them why hiring the cheapest temporary staff was not a method to an effective implementation of lean. And that the idea of always cut cost, cut cost, cut cost doesn't result in higher productivity or higher profitability. A completely different way to have a core story is to think about ways to brand your service process, to create a story around how you do things differently that illustrates why the way people are used to doing things today doesn't work. Um, the example I mentioned earlier of an IT staffing company, we're looking at helping them create a core story around their service process that really talks about how recruiting for IT professionals has evolved greatly between the 90s and the 2000s and now in, in the current years. It's completely different in how you do it effectively and how this company has really evolved along with it and most of the internal recruiting practices and even the recruiting practices used by lots of the staffing industry haven't kept pace. So we want to illustrate and create a little bit of a fear amongst the buyer of how they might be doing something that's not really the best practice today. So those are all examples of core stories where you think about how do I create an educational message that gets the attention and interest of the decision maker I want to reach and then I slowly introduce our firm and I position us at the end of the story. It's not about just a sales pitch for your firm. And if nothing else works, then just learn to be better storytellers. Uh, we were at a meeting last week where we happened to have, hear a panel of staffing buyers talk. And what I got out of the message is these people are being called 8, 10, 12, 15 times a day and everybody sounds alike. So in your firm, try to develop a more distinctive voice, a voice that's maybe more innovative, more fun. Um, and I put on here, just be louder. Uh, for those of you who are in New York or I think parts of Florida, there's an auto dealer uh, named Fusillos. And uh, this very literally large gentleman, Billy Fusillo, who his tagline is, uh, it's huge. And he has these incredibly obnoxious commercials where it always ends with, it's huge. The thing is, they're obnoxious, everybody hates them, but in his case, just being louder works. Having this very distinctive, although not very pleasant voice, brings him a lot of business. And I'm not suggesting that everybody wants to be obnoxious, but it is a strategy, and it is a strategy that actually works in a lot of industries. In staffing, very few companies have a distinctive voice. I'd focus more on the being innovative and being more fun, but if you can't come up with a good way to do that, just being louder and bolder and a little more brash than everybody else can be quite effective. And the other thing to do is look at branding key members of your team, turning individuals in your organization into industry experts by having them focus on topics to write about on your blog and to speak about at conferences and to share information with the local SHRM group or the local manufacturers association. The idea is you take individuals in your organization and you turn them into experts at specific things that matter to your customers. So maybe you have one person who's a call center expert and another person who's a manufacturing expert and another person who's a healthcare IT expert. The idea is individuals in your team become experts at specific things. And I'll give some more examples of specific things in a minute or two. But they become experts at these things so that everybody in the industry you serve would want to talk to that expert on your firm. That becomes really powerful because it creates not only more desire to use your firm, but it creates a presence of you guys being highly competent in very specific areas, but not trying to be all things to all people. All right, now let's change gears. We're going to get a little more tactical. That was some of our highest level strategic stuff. Now we're going to talk about how do we sell smarter. 
The first and most obvious way to sell smarter is to sell solutions to problems. Problems like turnover, labor costs, jobs going unfilled, improving access to talent or getting access to talent that employers cannot access on their own, time to fill, other pains associated with either low quality labor, unfilled job openings, or the items listed above. And you might look at this list and you say, David, you know, these are painfully obvious. Every staffing company tries to sell around these issues. These are the issues that create demand for staffing companies. And I agree, it's, this is completely obvious stuff. But now ask yourself this question, are your salespeople selling strategically? Are they going out and asking qu questions of your clients to really diagnose their problems? Or are they mostly looking for unfilled staffing needs and trying to fill orders? What we find is probably 75, 80, 85 percent of the time, people are being more tactical and reactive to needs for staffing than they are being strategic. And especially as the economy gets better, the labor market tightens up, we tend to, to get more and more reactive to hiring needs because we have more and more employers that need hiring. But the more we just react, the more we put us back in that commodity box. And then even if you can find the talent somebody needs, they're going to say, well, so-and-so can do it for less. So how do you become a little more strategic in your sales process? First thing is training. Uh, most staffing, salespeople and recruiters need more training, not on staffing and recruiting, but on business issues. You need to understand your client's industry as well or better than your clients do. Then you need to give the sales team, the recruiting team, a process for how they go about collecting information, whether it's forms they complete, whether it's apps they have that are tied to your staffing software, uh, whether you take them through a, an approach like a Miller-Hyman that has a structured worksheet for how to gather information about the prospect, you want to create a process-driven approach that everybody in your team can sell the same way. When it comes to solving problems, you want to use the collective wisdom of the group. Um, a lot of times when you're in sales, there's a pressure to hear a problem, give a solution. We don't want to do that. We want to hear a problem, and then we want to work with our team to go back and brainstorm the solution and present solutions back to clients. Now, in a short matter of time, you're going to hear almost every client problem imaginable. And if you consistently document, here's ideas on how to solve these different types of problems, and you keep a library of those, now your sales team has great resources with specific solutions they can come back and present to clients with having to do very little work. But going back and brainstorming does a couple of things. One, it improves the quality of your solutions because you get more people giving input. And two, it educates every salesperson and every recruiter because they benefit from the wisdom of the group. And lastly, uh, make it a habit to collect metrics. I find very few staffing companies are really good at collecting metrics around the results they deliver. So tracking what was the problem before we came in, what solution did we implement, and what's the tangible outcome in terms of reduced turnover, reduced labor cost, increase, or can we decrease time to fill, improving talent quality or somehow else eliminating the pain the client has. The more you can document this and build case studies, the more you can use those case studies when selling to create differentiation and sell higher value solutions to your clients. Related to that is to become an expert at something. And it really can be almost anything that you can have expertise at, whether that expertise is functional in a vertical market, a process, or subject matter. And what do I mean by this? Functional expertise might be something like we're an expert at digital marketing, we're an expert at employee benefits or tax, we're experts in trauma nursing. If you can develop functional expertise that is better than the average staffing company in your niche market, you now have a way to differentiate to open the door with every new prospective client. Vertical markets are the way a lot of staffing firms differentiate in healthcare, IT, logistics, but getting more precise about that market that you serve or multiple markets that you serve, creating the way a recruiting firm does specific practice areas or centers of expertise within your firm. Another way to do it is through process expertise. Um, becoming an expert, I mentioned lean manufacturing. I remember a staffing company up in uh, Massachusetts that the CEO used to be a lean manufacturing consultant. And he told me, he goes, David, I can walk in a plant, I literally can walk from one end of the plant to the other and have a checklist of things the company is doing wrong from a lean manufacturing perspective. Well, that expertise was what got him in the door because he understood process. So whether you're an expert in lean manufacturing or ERP implementation, workforce planning or recruiting process optimization, becoming a process area 
expert is another way to completely differentiate your firm and get you an opportunity to open in the door with a client as a consultant, as an expert, as a trusted advisor, rather than as a commoditized deliverer of temporary help. And the last way is to look at subject matter expertise, and this is the one I was recommending you do with te individual team members. Having team members become experts at a specific thing like the recruiting process, or optimizing hiring, or motivating workers, or employee retention, or sourcing strategies. You want, with subject matter expertise, to have it be relatively tightly defined so that, again, you can stand out from every other company that has a little bit of knowledge in these individual subject areas. And when you're selling your services, you want to act just like a consultant does. So you don't go in thinking at all about staffing problems. You go in with a real genuine curiosity about your client's business issues. You might even have sales teams that are focused around specific types of clients by industry, by company size, by functional area, or experts that you can bring in to help diagnose issues for a client in a specific area. You want to then understand the economics of your staffing services and how you can deliver value to solve problems using staffing as a strategic tool to shorten time to hire reduce labor cost, reduce hiring cost, reduce turnover. You then want to do your diagnosis and propose solutions before you actually getting into trying to sell services. Because if they buy a solution, price is secondary to the benefit they get from the solution. If they're buying temporary help or if they're buying contingent staffing services, that's going to be more at a commoditized price. I had somebody just ask a question I want to jump in. What if we only have six employees in a couple of offices? We've got one salesperson, a couple of recruiters, a couple of offices. Um, Mike, you're not going to be an expert at all things to all people. I would have every recruiter develop some area they're passionate about to be a specialist in. Not that they can't serve other clients, but they should be a lead expert in some area. And if even if everybody focuses on the same industry, then there may be different types of clients with that industry that they could focus on, or different geographies you could focus on. The salesperson sort of has to be an expert at diagnosing the problems. They have to be trained how to ask great questions and then bring in the recruiting specialist for each specific client. So even in a very small company, you can create practice areas, centers of excellence that you know more than the competition about. And the smaller you are, the benefit is the more tightly you can define the marketplace because you don't need to be all things to all people to be very successful. And the last uh, slide in this section is really about how to integrate marketing with your selling. And some of you may have read this, this blog post that, uh, that we did a little bit ago that really talked about how to better think about integrating marketing with sales and where you might have gaps in your sales process. Now, with marketing, our goal is to do a few things, to get someone's attention before we pick up the phone, to give them a reason to want to meet with us, to have a powerful story that entices someone to have curiosity about the problems we can solve or the problems they didn't even know about in their business. Marketing's role is after the sales call to nurture relationships to help you stay top of mind. So if you look at this diagram on the right, you know you can see sales marked in this in the funnel here, but not till way down in the funnel. At the very top, you're doing marketing things to, to attract people to you, creating um, quote unquote bait through great content that you share on social media, that you blog about, that you speak about, that you email to people. That is about pulling people into the sales funnel, creating a soft lead, meaning they're interested in your ideas. They're not ready to buy from you. They're just interested in the ideas you have to share. They may opt in for your newsletter. They may download something from your website. They may attend a webinar, just like this one. But once they're in the funnel, then you can use tools like marketing automation or even your manual sales follow-up to try to get them to become actual prospects who are sales ready. Now, the, on the left side of the funnel, you see direct marketing, PPC, SEO, and referrals. Those are marketing functions designed to bring people right into the middle of the funnel where we're going to go directly after the people we want to do business with and capture them at the time they have an interest in our services pull them in to be sales ready. But sales role as the funnel is really close to the bottom. Spend your time with people who are already prospects. Help them diagnose their problems. Help brainstorm solutions. Provide them with estimates and creative ideas to solve problems. And then show them why your net value is better than the competition. And therefore, they shouldn't care about the fact that your markup is 60% and the other guy's is 50 Because at the end of the day, 
they're going to spend less working with you because of the solutions you provide. All right, now it's time to get a little more tactical. And we're going to take a look at how to optimize some of the sales things you're already doing every single day. All right, so first thing, take a look at your website and then optimize your website. But here, not for search engines, optimize your website for humans. You know, we occasionally, sometimes more than occasionally, we'll have people who say, you know what, we're doing this marketing and it just doesn't work, we're not getting any response. And we'll go look at Google Analytics and we'll see that the marketing has doubled or tripled or quadrupled or sometimes a tenfold increase in traffic to their website, but then nothing's happening. So then we'll look at the website and say, you know what, maybe we need to look at how do we get more conversion out of this site. How do we create more lead capture pages? There, this can be landing pages designed to get someone to take an action that they become a real sales lead or a real candidate searching for a job. Uh, one of the companies we work with, a company in New Jersey, I was talking to him about this concept and he got really excited because he said, you know what, we have over a thousand lead capture pages on our website. We look at every job, every vertical market, every industry segment, and we find a way to create a lead capture page around that. And I thought that was very clever of them because they had all this great optimized content designed to attract very specific types of buyers and to pull them in as sales leads. Now, a thousand is more than most companies are going to do, but most staffing companies' lead capture page consists of a contact us form and maybe a job application. There are lots of opportunities to create more lead capture pages. There are also lots of ways to add more calls to action to your website, whether those calls to action are with text links, buttons, small forms that may be in the sidebars or footers of websites, flyouts that pop up as you go down the page to encourage people to take specific actions, or having a live chat feature. A really well-designed website thinks about on every page, what action do I want someone to take, and then how can I encourage them to take that action by making it really visually obvious what we want them to do. And the last thing is to look at how do we simplify contacting us with shorter and easier forms. I was looking at, for some research to help corroborate that statement in prepping for this, this webinar, and uh, I found some information on HubSpot's website that says, every field that you put on a form after three will lower your response. So if you've got first name, last name, email, or name, company, email, everything after that means you're going to get fewer responses. Now, if you're looking to, to qualify responses, not maximize responses, you might want more fields. What we like to see is that you know, in an ideal world, if you can integrate things like a Facebook or, or LinkedIn to be able to allow people to provide their confirmation, contact information with one click, and then if you need to capture any other information, do that with the other fields. Or keep those fields down to two, excuse me, those forms down to two or three fields, get the response, and then qualify more in your follow-up, whether that follow-up is done in an automated fashion, using marketing automation, or it's done by your sales team. The next thing is to look at optimizing your jobs. And we've talked about this in our last couple of webinars, so I'm not going to be too redundant. If you missed our, our whole uh, hour-long workshop on how to optimize your jobs to improve recruiting, uh, let us know. We'll be happy to get you a link to the recording. But basically, you want to make sure every job is optimized for search engines, that the jobs are really on your website, that you're writing job titles that are engaging, and then use words that people will be searching for, but also words that will make your job stand out when somebody sees them on Indeed or Simply Hired. You want to automatically feed your jobs to job aggregators. You want to be able to use an RSS feed to post them to social sites, and you want to be cross-promoting your jobs throughout your website. The idea is we're doing everything possible on our website and outside our website to get people to find our individual jobs so that we can get more response just by putting the jobs on our website and doing zero additional work. Uh, and for our, uh, we had another question come in. Do we have any uh, statistics on staffing firm success with new business generated from websites? Been in the business for 20 plus years and kind of one hand, how many new clients are generated by a corporate website? And the answer to that one is it varies client by client. Um, we've seen clients who literally in their first month of having a new website up have generated more than enough business to pay for multiple years of the cost of building and operating that website. And a website should be looked at as a three to five year investment. Uh, one of our clients in Seattle who just installed a, a job board of ours to optimize their job said, you know, in, in five years of running my business, I've only ever had two people apply online. One was uh, about a year after we got in business and it was a referral. And the second one was 
three days after we put your job board on our website and people found our optimized jobs. So if you're doing search engine optimization, if you're producing content, if you're sharing content and you're driving people to that website and then the website is built to convert, the return on investment on a website is exceptionally high. Yes, it can be a, you know, three, five, ten, maybe even a $15,000 one-time investment, but the return on that investment will be measured uh, many times, orders of magnitude over, over the life of the website. The next thing is to look at optimizing the blog post that you're doing. And if you're not blogging, to make sure that you are blogging. When it comes to search engine optimization, blogging is probably your single best tool for regularly showing up in search results. So how do you do that? First thing is add more blog posts, post more frequently. Second thing is to make sure you optimize each individual post around the URL, the, the titles, the keywords you're using in the post. But the thing that we're finding is really critical is not just thinking about optimizing it for search engines, but optimizing your blog for human beings. How? Well, you add graphics. So you see in the center middle uh, graphic says the unlikely career choice, hacking the Silicon Valley elite. That is a header graphic that was added to the blog post to make this post stand out, not just on the company's blog, but when they share the blog on social media so that it's branded to this company, that it shares the title of the post, and that it has an intriguing graphic to get someone's attention to bring more people back to the blog. Then once they're at their blog, we need to have calls to action highlighted. And I see so many blogs and staffing that there's no call to action on the blog. So the call to action should both be in the design of the blog page, which you see on the bottom left, an example of a company, uh, how to help your employees fall in love with their jobs again, which has a nice header graphic. And then on the right side of the blog design, there's three buttons, find a job, send a resume, submit a job order. We've got calls to action right next to every single job post. And then you can also optimize the post within in each post with call to action banners. And that's the bottom right of the screen where you see the big giant contact our team graphic that's a, a, a banner graphic stuck at the bottom of the post, so anybody who's read, reading through the post, we're directing them what we want them to do next with a really big, really obvious call to action. The next area to optimize is your email marketing. So in staffing, we live on email. We, are, we live in email for our prospecting. We live on it for customer service. We live on it for candidate communication. One of the things we recommend doing is looking at your sales emails and trying to standardize them. The, and that doesn't mean they have to be exactly the same every single time, but you want to look across your organization and figure out what are best practices for the emails that we're sending out all the time. So an email that is used to send out to a new prospect that's cold versus an email that's sent out to somebody after a first call versus an email that's sent out with a proposal versus the, an email that's sent out to follow up after a candidate's been placed. You want to create templates for your sales team based on what you found to be the best practices for your business and let the sales team start with those templates rather than starting from scratch every time. Now most salespeople will keep their own templates, but very often they don't share across the organization. You want to share them and whether you're using Outlook or your CRM or your ATS system to store them, have a place where you keep standard emails that everybody can use as a starting point. You want to add more visuals into your emails. People are getting used to wanting to see pictures everywhere. You know, I saw a great piece of advice that says a text in an email should be no more than three to five sentences. And I saw another one that said three to five lines. But emails, people are reading on the fly. They're reading them on a phone. So where you can use pictures to help tell the story, to keep the text shorter, do so. When you're connecting with people on LinkedIn, develop standard ways to invite people to connect that are more compelling. You know, give somebody a strong reason. Why should they want to connect with you? Why is it in their best interest to be connected to a staffing firm salesperson or recruiter or the owner of a staffing company? In the email itself, you can have those same CTA call to action visuals, the same ones we saw in the, in the blog posts, make great footers in an email. I know at Haley Marketing Group, we keep a whole collection of different email signatures that we'll pick and choose from with different graphics. And we create new ones around every event, like some of you probably received emails from us that had an invite to today's webinar. We, we created a, a graphic for this event. We'd recommend to clients to create graphics to promote hot jobs, to address specific types of problems. Like maybe somebody's got an issue with ACA compliance and they don't know where to turn. 
why not have a graphic for that that goes to your Contact Us page on your website? The idea is you can have different pre-saved email signatures with graphics that your whole sales team can use. And that ties in the next point is having multiple versions of the signature. It doesn't have to be one size fits all. Uh, vary it up. Create new versions every month because as you mix up your signature, one, it makes people pay attention because it's not always the same. Two, it's a great place to promote content, events, and calls to action. And finally, make sure that your emails are optimized for mobile. Uh, if you're using a third-party system to do email marketing or even just using Outlook, make sure that whatever you're sending out looks great, not just on your desktop, but on your phone because the stats are now about 70% of people's email is getting read on a mobile device. Next up is think about how can we drive more traffic to the website. And you know, b this is definitely not a case of if you build it, they will come for a great website. So you have to think about all the ways outside your website you can drive traffic. Now the first is social sharing, whether I'm sharing content on LinkedIn, one-to-one -one or in groups, um, whether I'm sharing it on Facebook, I'm doing it on Twitter, maybe I'm creating videos on YouTube, I'm do trying to get more social reviews to drive people. The more you're doing things around your website, the goal is to maximize traffic to get more people coming to your site. One of the strategies most staffing companies aren't looking at using is guest posting on other websites. So we're seeing a lot of companies that now are writing their own blogs, but they're not taking those blogs and putting them on other sites, whether those other sites are an industry they serve, their local chamber of commerce, or even going to LinkedIn and posting the same content that's on their blog as a post on LinkedIn, because LinkedIn will help share your content with other people who might be interested. And of course, anytime you're creating content to make sure you're optimizing it for search engines, so people who are searching for answers to specific problems will find your content, and then maybe even using PPC or pay-per-click advertising to target specific people based on their demographics or based on their interests to drive them back to your website. And, and another question came in about you know, the website getting businesses directly depending on the, the niche of staffing you're in. I couldn't agree more. Um, some niches will see more web traffic. I think if you're in technical staffing, it's kind of ironic. The guys who spend all their times online may be harder to get to your website. Uh, also, if you're dealing maybe with uh, light industrial workforce and you're not going to see the, the light industrial workers as much coming to your website or certainly not the supervisors who spend their day on a plant floor. However, we're thinking about how do we get content in front of people where they might consume it. Everybody walks around with a mobile device these days, a smartphone. How do we get our content in front of them where they might consume it on a social site, on YouTube, on Facebook, on LinkedIn? Can we connect with them directly on Twitter? A lot of you are live tweeting with us right now doing one-to-one -one contacts where we're augmenting this webinar with more content to make it a better experience. Ultimately, it's going to bring you back to our website where hopefully you'll engage with us. You can do the exact same thing in your firm. And John, I do agree with you that it's different in different segments of staffing, but you really have to think about each audience you serve, what do they want, and how can I deliver it to them, ultimately through our own website, because that's the, that's the playing field that you own and you can control. And if you can get to them that playing field, you can get them to take action. Also want to make sure that everybody on your team is making a daily social investment. Um, and this can be as little as 15 minutes, it can be as little sometimes as five minutes. But what you're trying to do with your social investment is to build your network, connect with more people. If you love LinkedIn, build your LinkedIn network. If you live every day on Twitter, build your Twitter network. Facebook may be a business account, depends on the kind of staffing you're in and, and who you're connecting with. If I'm in healthcare and I'm trying to connect with my nurses, my my allied health workers, I might have a, a Facebook presence that's professional, not my company page, but I might as a recruiter have one where I connect with people and build relationships with people I know. And I'm going to spend time every day expend, extending my networks. I'm also going to spend time using tools in our blog to sh share content, just collect, clicking the button that says share on LinkedIn or share on Facebook so that I'm going to share the stuff we're writing or maybe I'll share content that I found that's not stuff we created but just interesting but it creates dialogue with people. So I usually share once, twice a month, maybe three times a month content from other sources and I'll do that on LinkedIn. And then I'll share content from our blog every time we have something new. And part of your daily social investment is to create one-to-one -one conversations. Think of the, it as your daily cold calling by a social where you can contact and address people you could never reach if you try to pick up the phone. So I can get the, the LinkedIn handle of senior executives at a key account 
and direct message them on Twitter or I can reach them on LinkedIn. I can go directly to those people and start to nurture a relationship by sharing content, sharing great ideas, getting them to be interested in our core story so that ultimately they see me as someone who can solve specific kinds of problems they have that are related to staffing and recruiting and then they pick up the phone and call me or they're willing to take my call as a follow-up. But that should be minimum of 5 to 15 minutes every single day spent doing these activities on social media to drive traffic to your website, to drive traffic to you individually if you're in sales or recruiting. And speaking of your sales calls, we want to make every call you make more productive. So don't just call. We want to mail to people prior to a call or email to people prior to a call. Why do we want to do something prior to call? Because we want to try to get their attention before we pick up the phone. So we're making the probability of a call turning into a conversation greater. Now you may want to intentionally call off hours to leave voicemails and that might be a, as a follow-up to a mail piece or an email piece. The idea is when you integrate multiple channels of communication in going after a target client, your probability of being successful in reaching that target client goes up dramatically as opposed to just picking up the phone. If you're going to do drop-offs, make your drop-offs stand out. Don't just hand out a brochure. Hand out something that's a really intriguing, thought-provoking piece of content. And be willing to explain to the person you're dropping it with what it's all about, why you dropped it off, why you hope it will be beneficial to that particular company's business in the hopes that they'll share it with the key decision makers in that business who aren't going to come down to the front door to talk to you. Share collateral that isn't just a brochure. Share some sort of educational core story. Um, turn it into a, a booklet. Turn it into a PowerPoint presentation. Turn it into a, a video on YouTube that you can use to create interest in the story to then create interest in the conversation. Do better planning in advance. Um, that panel I mentioned of HR professionals that I saw speak, you know, their number one recommendation was to staffing people was do your homework. Don't pick up the phone and just call me. Do your homework. Know who we are, what we do, why we do it, and how you as a staffing service provider or you as a recruiter can solve a problem for me that I'm not already getting solved. The more planning you do, the more you can target that initial direct mail piece, the more you can target your initial email, the more you can target that call to be really relevant. And if it's relevant, your chance of success goes up. And of course, to have better follow-up, meaning really focusing on solutions and nurturing, not follow-up about selling staffing services. Uh, next thing is to look at putting your marketing on autopilot. So if you're not already doing marketing automation, you may want to take a look at marketing automation. And we're probably going to do a webinar later this year with a full hour on this, but very quickly, marketing automation is about integrating software with your website so that you can automatically respond to people who visit certain pages or who download certain things from your website. You can track repeat visitors and let your sales team know when a certain prospect has visited your services page five times. You can create ways to score leads so that at the right time sales knows, hey, this is somebody who's very likely to be interested. You can send follow-up reminders to the sales team. You can also create email communications to regularly nurture relationships with the clients and prospects and talent. And you can help your sales team better manage their pipeline so they know who's about to close and you can get more accurate forecasting of the upcoming sales. Again, so you, you can help figure out where to best spend your time and help your management team better figure out what your upcoming sales are going to look like. All right, and we're getting near the end. Our next section is some uh, almost free marketing. So one of my favorite ways to get free marketing is to just spend a little time and a little creativity doing stuff like we're doing right now, speaking, writing, collecting market research with your clients and candidates, sending out press releases. It costs nothing to invest some time in doing these activities, zero, but it does cost time. And so you want to think about how do we come up with 
ways, to, topics to talk about or write about or to research that would be really interesting to our clients. And that starts by really understanding our clients. That goes back to brainstorming with your team, getting everybody together and making a list of what are the top problems our clients are having right now? What are the top problems job seekers are having? Yes, it's hard to find talent, but beyond that, what are the problems? And what are the implications of those problems? If they can't find talent, what does it cost their business? And if you don't know the answer to these questions, then do the research. Go out and survey your clients. Ask them what are their biggest problems. What are their challenges they're having related to hiring, retention, turnover, and staffing? And then also, every time you do something really great in your organization, collect those case studies build your success stories, turn them into PR. Your local newspaper, your local business publications, they don't want to write a press release, or they don't want to write a story about how ABC Staffing is a wonderful company, but they love stories about how a local organization is putting more people to work, or a local organization is driving productivity, or doing things to be a leader in their industry, and you as the staffing company can help to tell those stories. That's how you turn your services into news that gets you free publicity. And then you just think about where can I deliver these different types of content. I can speak at local conferences, lunch and learns, or like we're doing right now, webinars. I can blog through my newsletter, or through my blog, by producing a newsletter, by creating white papers, by being a guest columnist for somebody else. And in terms of market research, think industry issues, salary surveys, the challenges your clients are having, any kind of research study that you could turn around and develop into a report. All right, I promised you we'd go through these things and do a little Q&A, but one thing I didn't put in the agenda is just some quick bonus stuff. Um, at Haley Marketing Group, we work really hard to try to make great marketing, world-class marketing, more affordable to every staffing and recruiting firm, and we've done some really cool things in the past year, and I'm just going to quickly touch on a few of them. If you want information, let us know after the webinar, and then we'll wrap up with Q&A. So a few of the things that we've done. Um, we've talked today a lot about content marketing. So we have really blown out our Haley Mail service to increase the volume and types of content that are available so that we have a completely unique process and content methodology for helping you create those core stories, tell, tell the great educational tales in your market to drive people to your website to make them want to work with you. We've expanded our pay-per-click advertising to help more companies efficiently use pay-per-click to go after specific people to drive them to their websites to consume content, to inquire about services. Um, some of you may have seen we've launched a reputation management service to help you get more reviews to build a stronger online presence so that at a very low cost, you can be improving your SEO, you can be improving your online brand, again, driving more people to your website and making sure when people check you out, they're seeing nothing but or mostly all the positive things about your organization. Uh, a lot of you probably saw we upgraded our job board to add in all of those SEO capabilities I talked about earlier. And I apologize that we duplicated a slide there, so I will open it up for additional questions. All right, one has come in so far, and if, by the way, if you want any, any information on any of the, the new things, just feel free, let us know, reach out just to an, on Twitter or through our website, and I will talk about some of the questions that have come in for our remaining time, and, and again, I will stay on later if anybody would like to continue beyond the 3 o'clock Eastern deadline. So first, um, question, which traffic driving content is most important for staffing companies with a very limited budget for content creation? That's a great question and I would say the most important content is the content that is around the challenges, issues and interests that your clients and candidates have. And I would actually say there's probably one even more important, having optimized jobs on your website. That's probably number one because the majority of traffic to your website are going to be job seekers. The majority of job seekers come to your website because they're interested in the jobs you have open. But beyond that, if you're looking to get more conversion, I would look at the pain points my clients have, and I try to be a specialist in one, two, three of those top pain points, and write blog content and share on social media around those pain points. Because the more you're really targeted around the issues your clients are having, the more you're gonna, they're going to find your content, the more you're going to want to read it, the more they're going to be attracted to your website as you share it with them in places like social media. Uh, Next question, I suggest some prospects uh, 60 sec 67 or eliminate a voicemail so they can listen 
if they delete all staffing industry calls too. I call off hours a lot. Do you agree? Yeah, I think, I think it's exactly right. Um, I think a lot of decision makers do just to hit the delete button as soon as it's, they get to a voicemail from a staffing company. Um, I think when you use voicemail as a tool in conjunction with email and in conjunction with direct mail and in conjunction with social media, now you're maximizing the probability they're going to see your message. And again, even when you leave a voicemail, what's the compelling reason that somebody wants to talk to you? If it's because you're asking about a staffing need that they have, uh, that's not going to fly. If it's because you're addressing a pain point that you've seen in another company that's just like theirs, well, they probably have the same pain point, and now there's a reason to respond. On that voicemail or in that introductory email, you want to demonstrate your knowledge of their business so that you're personalizing your core story for the individual prospect, and I'd recommend using all the channels. I, I kind of agree with you that the voicemails during the day um, probably are not going to get returned, but maybe having them so that they're available first thing in the morning. I do like the idea of call, off hours a lot. One of the interesting things we found is if you're marketing to senior executives, um, we get a tremendous response to email at weird hours, weekends, late at night, first thing in the morning, because that's when a lot of senior executives are checking their email. I have some of my best conversations with our clients and our prospects at 10 and 11 o'clock at night. And I do that because they're online when I'm online, and it's a great time to chat, schedule meetings, um, much easier to reach those people than during the day when they're busy running their business. All right, next question. How important is a mission statement in marketing? Uh, that's a great question. And, and a mission statement, you know, I think having a core purpose, I think most mission statements are, are really poorly worded. I think you need to have a core purpose that says, why do we exist? What's the value we are bringing to the world? And then you need to think about what's the, what do we want to be better at than anybody else on the planet? You really want to focus on having a value proposition that can't be duplicated because if you can build your service process around having this awesome core purpose, this awesome value proposition, and you live it, now your marketing is much easier because basically you're telling the core story to get people intrigued, but your value proposition is already differentiated, and now it makes selling way easier. It also makes it easier to attract people to work for your company, to explain your value when you have this great core story. So I don't really like traditional mission statements. I do like having a great core purpose, core story, value proposition, and, and a very succinct list of clear goals that your team can understand. The next question. Uh, how or where do we identify pain points in industry so we can educate ourselves before we contacting a new prospect? First thing, uh, contact your existing clients and ask them what their biggest pain points are. And then if it's a specific industry segments, do research to see are there trade magazines that serve that industry? Are there trade associations? If so, go to their website. You might want to join the association. You might want to go to a conference for the, for, the, for the association. You might want to read the trade publications. One of the things we do is we contact the trade publications and ask for their media kits because inside the media kit, we don't really want to buy an ad, but what we want is the editorial calendar that tells us what they're going to write about each and every month because they're studying the pain points in their client's industry, so they've already done all the homework for you. So it's a great way for absolutely free to figure out topics of interest to your customers. Okay, I want to thank everybody very much for joining us for today's Lunch with Haley webinar. Uh, coming up next month, we've got two webinars. We have a Lunch with Haley and another product demonstration. The uh, Lunch with Haley is uh, one of our annual really exciting ones. Next month is the Staffing Industry Executive Forum. So on the last day of March, uh, we have four people going to the exec forum this year. We'll be taking as many notes as we can, and we'll be sharing our feedback of the executive forum on Tuesday, March 31st. And a little earlier in the month, on Tuesday, March 17th, I mentioned Haley Mail and some of the awesome things that we've done to make this the one and only complete content marketing program for the staffing industry. We're going to take you on a demo. Uh, Haley Mail is really too complicated to explain in just a few minutes, so we are going to show you what the product is, how it works, and how it might be of value to your organization. And from all of us at Haley Marketing Group, uh, thank you very much for the time today. Really enjoyed uh, having an opportunity to present to you, and I hope that we'll see you on an upcoming Lunch with Haley or Product Demo webinars.